What is up, everybody? Everybody say, I'm alive. I'm awake. I feel great. So good to see you all today. Welcome to those watching online. Let's also give it up for our first time guests here at NCC. So glad you're here with us today. And you know what? God's doing some great things around the world. He's doing a great thing in his church around the world. And right now there's uh, people that are not able to gather like we're gathering. Uh, my cousin pastors a church in Sacramento, California, and they just can't gather. And it's illegal to gather. There are a few churches that, are, that have gathered and the lawsuit slapped on them. So I just want us to pause just for a minute and thank God for our, the privilege of being able to worship together, study God's word. And I'm, I'm so excited about today's session. We're in this series, Table Manners, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about headship, what headship is all about. And we know that God is a God of order. He's a God of, of structure. When you think of headship, think of how God organizes things and He puts things in alignment. That's how our God works. And we see this throughout Scripture, how important it is for us to understand how he controls things and how he is over everything. And, and, and I know that being a follower of Christ sometimes doesn't seem like there's much abundance or abundant life that's been promised to us. Because uh, scripture says uh, you, you'll have abundant life, have it. you'll have a, a life that uh, is not taken by the enemy. The enemy's come to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to give us that abundant life. And so many people say, well, where is that abundant life that, that Christ has promised? I know that we're supposed to be living joyful lives, lives full of love and peace, and, or I'm not uh, filled with anxiety, I, I'm not, my life is not overcome with fear. Well, understanding headship gives us a peek into how God really works and how we are privileged and blessed and we benefit from, from God's order of things. So let's pray to that end as we dive in today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to worship, to sing, to be in fellowship. And God, to study your word, I pray, God, that we could truly receive from your word the things that you want us to learn so that we can live it out in our everyday lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. You know, as, as members of, of the body of Christ, we never outgrow serving one another. We never outgrow being submitted to God. When, when we talk about submission to God, you know, that submission sounds like a dirty word, but trust me, it's a, it's a good word. Submit, it's, it's to come up under. It's, it's a voluntary action. And so as we voluntary, as we, as we give our lives to God, we know that worship is important. Think of all the ships in the Bible, the, the, the gospel ships. You know, we've got worship, we have stewardship, we have leadership, we have discipleship, membership, fellowship. And there's a lot of talk about all of these ships, but very few people want to talk about headship. And yet headship is one of the most important things that we can learn because it really does affect our lives in real time. It affects our everyday lives, coming up under the headship of God. When we don't understand uh, the flow or God's order of things, we can tend to be prideful. We can tend to feel entitled. When things don't go our way, we get hot and bothered, we get upset with God and cranky with others. And, and, and so when we dive into Scripture and see how important this is, you have to go back and see how Satan has wanted to uh, propagate his lie, his, his very nature, and, and push it on us. To understand who Satan is, who Lucifer is, you've got to go back you see in Ezekiel 28, you won't see this on the screen, but Ezekiel 28 talks about that he was once the anointed cherub or anointed angel that covered. He, every precious stone was his covering. He was a very beautiful, beautiful angel. The Bible actually says in Ezekiel 28 that, that music was embedded in him. He had pipes and organs and he would make beautiful music and he was a glorious creation of God that became very prideful. And in Isaiah 14, it says that he said, I will arise, I will ascend above the Most High. He wanted to be God. He had this attitude of, of, of arrogance and ego, and, and so God kicked him out of heaven. Matter of fact, Jesus referenced the fall of Satan in, in the gospel. Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven as lightning. So when, when Satan was kicked out of heaven, Satan had access 
to God. He was at the table of the Lord in the presence of God, became very prideful, was kicked out of heaven, relegated to earth. And while he was on earth, he began to, uh, to tempt or start his temptation campaign with Adam and Eve. He came to Adam and Eve. He tempted Eve first and said, if you'll eat of this forbidden fruit, hey, God said you shouldn't eat of it, but I say go ahead and eat it because you'll become your own God. And so the temptation was for them to be their own masters, to be their own God. And, and, and so pride was introduced to Adam and Eve and the rest is history. But the curse, when you look at Genesis, you see that the curse that God placed on all of creation, he placed on Adam and Eve, but he also placed a curse on Satan. And in Genesis 3.15, many of you know this verse, it is the proto-evangelion or the proto-eschatol. That's the 16-cylinder word. So what is proto-evangelion? Prototype means the first of its kind. Proto-evangelion is the first gospel. You see the first gospel mentioned in Genesis 3.15 where God said, he said to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the woman's offspring. And her offspring, uh, you're going to bruise her offspring's heel, but her offspring's heel is going to crush your head. And so it's a prophecy against the work of Satan in the earth that ultimately his head is going to be crushed. His power is going to be obliterated. And this is the hope that we have in Christ because the Bible says that Christ came to destroy the works of Satan. And so we, we look into scripture and we see that, hey, Anyone who becomes prideful, anyone who is arrogant, anyone who has a big head, anyone who is puffed up, there's going to be destruction that follows. The Bible says that pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So it is important for us to examine what it, what it means to live a life of humility before God. You know, that's a humility, that's another word that people think is a dirty word. You know, nobody wants to sign up for humility, the humility class. We're going to be teaching classes on humility. Well, so I'm not going to go that. I already know how to be humble. Well, that's pride right there. So, so you know, it's like trying to grab a wet bar of soap when you're blinded by shampoo in the shower. You just can't get a hold of it. So what is humility? Humility is not just the, the uh, it's not being demure. It's not being quiet or soft-spoken. Humility is not uh, being passive. Humility is not just thinking less of yourself. Check this out. Pastor Timmy just read this in James 4, 6-7. I love this. It says, but he gives us more grace. We can stop right there and shout hallelujah on that one. He gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So what is humility? What, we know what it's not. We know that humility does involve a, a quiet spirit, maybe a gentle heart. We know that humility includes that, but that's not the true definition of humility. We see in Scripture that humility is when we celebrate and submit to the headship of God. When we give our lives to God completely, wholly, completely to God, and we say, Lord, I am yours. I am submitted to your plan. I'm submitted to your cause. I'm submitted to your work on the earth. I'm submitted to the structure that you placed on earth. And I, I know my place under your authority. Humanism is, is just another word for Satanism because Satan's temptation is that we would be our own God. Satan has been trying to convince us that we are head honcho, that we are top dog. And, and God's word says the otherwise. It says, it says the very opposite. And so when you see Christ, Christ, the eternal son of God, came to earth, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death. The Bible says that Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Think about that. The, the greatest power in the world humbled himself to become a servant. You know, who, Jesus, he's the one we're focusing on. He's the one we're fixated on. He's the one we're following. He, he's the one that we're putting our trust in, our hope in. He's the captain of our salvation. He is the kingly Messiah. 
Jesus is the wonder worker. Come on, y'all. He is the friend of sinners and outcasts. He is the illuminator. He's the judge. He's the lawgiver. He's the liberator. He's the burden bearer. He's the intercessor. He's the only savior, the only wise God. He's the alpha, the omega. Come on, somebody. He's the beginning and the end. This same Jesus humbled himself. And the Bible says that all power was given unto him in heaven and in earth. It all comes through humility. Jesus had a and an authority and a power that was uncommon. And when when we look at God's grace, and we look at how He gives grace to those who are humble, that sets it up to where we can truly resist evil. You cannot resist Satan if you're just like him. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying, you know, is that, that, here's the big takeaway. Those who understand headship will not butt heads with others or with God. Those who understand headship will not butt heads with others or with God. Turn to somebody and tell them, don't be a... No, don't do that. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. So you see, because of pride, because of ego, we, we tend to fight with others. So with some people, it's a conflict on every hand, on every turn. Conflict with others, conflict with God. When things don't go our way, we can get cranky with God and upset with others. And we just, we, we, we get into this cycle of entitlement where when, when things are not going our way, we get all hot and bother, bothered. Maybe when, when we get a position in life, you ever seen someone that get a, they get a new position, they get a new job description and man, it goes right to their head and, and they get the big head. They want to be head honcho. They have the Barney Fife syndrome, you know, Barney Fife. Barney Fife was one, and we laugh at Barney Fife because Andy, the sheriff, he's calling the shots. He's the shot caller, but man, Barney Fife wants to be the shot caller, and when Andy makes a decision, Barney says, no, Andy, I think I know better, and you've seen episodes where Barney then, he steps into this authoritarian role, and all of his underlings, he wants to put his thumb, and we, and we laugh at that, and that's funny. But y'all have to keep this in mind that whenever there's an abuse of authority or a lack of humility, an absence of humility, there will be a satanic stronghold. You can just mark that down. That's what we want to avoid and that's what we want to pray against that we do not unwittingly play into Satan's hand. Those who feel entitled to authority will always disrespect the authority above them and abuse their authority with those beneath them. Those that feel like, hey, I want to be the boss. I want to be the shot caller. I want to, I want to be the head honcho. I want to be the top dog. That's what Satan wanted, and it got him kicked out of heaven. So we want to walk the path of humility. We want to follow Christ, and we want to understand what, it, what a true life of power looks like. Jesus, whenever he would confront someone, it was usually someone from the religious crowd. See, politics, politics and religion are strange bedfellows. Politics and religion are, 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 are almost the same. Because when you look at Jesus and you see how he called out the religious leaders, he resorted to name calling. What did he call it? He called them snakes. He called them vipers. And that'd be a great message, sermon series, right? You know, calling people just what they are. They were snakes and vipers. He said, you are whitewashed tombs. He said, outwardly, you're a, white, you're a whitewashed sepulcher, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. This is what he's saying to the religious crowd. He even said that your father is the devil. So he is calling them out, saying that there is a demonic stronghold in that religious system. And, and, and while he was talking with his disciples one day, he gives them a lesson on the headship of God using these religious leaders as an example. Check this out. It's in Matthew chapter 23. This is the meat of our subject today. We're going to talk about this. Matthew 23, start at verse number one. I'm going to read this in the message paraphrase. You might want to read this in the ESV or the NLT later if you want to do some further study. But this is just the street language here that we can all understand. It says, Jesus turned to address his disciples along with the crowd that had gathered with them. He said, the religion scholars and Pharisees are competent teachers in God's law. You won't go wrong in following their teachings on Moses. But be careful about following them. They talk a good line, but they don't live it. They don't take it into their hearts and live it out in their behavior. It's all spit and polished veneer. Check this out. 
Here's this, this table metaphor. Instead of giving you God's law as food and drink, by which you can banquet on God, they package it in bundles of rules, loading you down like pack animals. They seem to take pleasure in watching you stagger under these loads and wouldn't think of lifting a finger to help. Their lives are perpetual fashion shows, embroidered prayer shawls one day and flowery prayers the next. They love, check this out, they love to sit at the head table at church dinners, basking in the most prominent positions, preening in the radiance of public flattery, receiving honorary degrees, getting called doctor and reverend. Don't let people do that to you, put you on a pedestal like that. You all have a, notice how this reads, you all have a single teacher, capital T, and you're all classmates. Don't set people up as experts over your life, letting them tell you what to do. Save that authority for God. Let him tell you what to do. No one else should carry the title of father. You only have one father, capital F, and he is in heaven. And don't let people maneuver you into taking charge of them. There's only one life leader, capital L, or one master, we could say, for you and them, and that's Christ. Do you want to stand out? Then step down. This is countercultural, right? Be a servant. If you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you. But if you're content to simply be yourself, your life will count for plenty. This is a long read, I know it, but it was worth our time today because there's so much in this. Jesus is showing us a glimpse of the Godhead. You see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in here. The religious leaders were setting themselves up as authoritarian figures and, and they wanted to demean those beneath them and they lorded over them and they were haughty, they were high-minded. This, this is in it's his religion, it's in politics, it's in the world today. But Jesus says there's only one Father, there's only one Teacher, and there's only one life leader or one master. So when we understand the Godhead and we come up under the headship that God has shown us in his word, we come up under the Godhead, we understand that our relationship with God is that he's our father. Well, then that means we're his humble children. There's no pride in that, right? So we know our identity. Our identity is not found in our positions in life. Our identity is found in coming up under the headship that God has outlined in his word, under that structure, under that, that, that order of things. So God is our father. We are his humble kids. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit teaches us all things. So if the Holy Spirit is our teacher, then we are his humble students, that's our, that's our position in life. We're God's kids. We're students. And if Jesus is our life leader or if he's our master, then that means we're his humble servants. So there you have it. You, you see this amazing truth that Jesus is spelling out for his disciples and saying, here's the recipe. Here's the order. Here's the way I want you to live. Headship is not, you know, having... Head, us having heady ideas or lofty ideas about God. No, it's, it's coming into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ, was, was, he came to earth by humble means. He was born in a manger. You can't get more humble than that. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. The, the king of glory, think about it. He lived a life, a sinless life, but a life where he didn't have a pillow to lay his head. He, 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 he didn't come in splendor. He didn't come riding in on a stallion. No, he, he just came in through the road of humility and then he died a humble death. He died the death of a common criminal. And so when we look to Christ, we see that this Savior, this humble Master, this Lord of Lords, this King of Kings has humbled himself. He's taken the humble road and, and he's asking us to come under him. Check this out. Paul says in Colossians, I love the way this reads in Colossians 2.9. Speaking of Christ, it says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head. Check it out, y'all. Jesus is the head of all principality and power. He is the head, we are the body, and we grow, up in a health, we grow up healthy in God only as He nourishes us. Look at verse 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility. Yeah, there's a fake humility. And the worship of angels, I'll just make a side note here. 
There's angels, there's good angels, bad angels. I believe a lot of the false religions in our world are just worshiping fallen angels because they would, when, they, when they appear to people, they seem as gods almost. Remember when the, when the angel of the Lord appeared to John the Revelator and John almost began to worship him? The angel said, don't worship me, worship God. So I believe that there are people that are worshiping false gods. They're worshiping fallen angels. It says, don't let anyone, don't let anyone uh, cause you to be puffed up when you worship these angels, intruding into things which you've not seen, vainly puffed up in your fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. So what I'm saying is that all power, all joy, all happiness, everything that, that, would, that we would need to make us complete, free from anxiety, free from fear, living an abundant life, a supernatural life, a, a life that is not walking after the flesh, but a life that's walking after the spirit. Not, not using the carnal mind to, to reason, but having a spiritual mind so we can understand things. That all comes under the headship of Christ. That comes under the authority of Christ. The irony is that so many people get the big head when they think they know more than others about the Godhead. Isn't that crazy? In religion, sometimes you know, some people know Scripture and they've, they've got a few verses that they've memorized, tucked under their belt. and they, they, it, It's so easy to, to walk in pride and to act like you know more than someone else. And I think that the reverse should be true, that we really need to be humble students of the Word, that, man, there is so much that I don't know about this Bible, but I am hungry and I want to know more. If you know something, I want you to share with me. I'm not the boss of things. And that's the attitude with which we should live our lives. Here's, a, here's my, first, my first main point today, and that is anointing, anointing and blessing flow if you don't butt heads with others. It's just, it's just so basic. Well, what, what are you talking about anointing? Anointing and blessing? Well, let's go back and look at, look, okay, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is, he is, his God has become salvation, Jesus Christ, or the Christ. Christ is not his last name, right? We know that. It mean, it's, a, it's a descriptor. Christ, the word Christ means the anointed one. It, 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 it actually, the word is covered in oil. It comes from the Old Testament when, when a king or a high priest would be uh, set aside, okay, we're going to set you up so that you can lead and, and you can govern. They were anointed, and it was symbolic of God's presence covering them. So Christ, the true anointed one, Jesus Christ, he, he is the head. And when anyone was anointed or crowned, it always started with a head. When a king is crowned, they put a crown on his head. When a priest was anointed, they anointed the head. So Christ is our king, and Christ is our priest. And we are Christians. The word Christ is in Christian. So we are anointed ones that are under the anointing of Christ. That, that's what it really means. If you say, I'm a Christian, it doesn't just mean you're a follower or a believer in Jesus. It, it, it means that you have come under the headship of Christ because he has authority. He is the one that we are not only following, he's the one that we're under. And the anointing that is anointed on Christ we get to benefit from that because we're under him. And there's a, 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 a really amazing scripture in Psalm 133, and I'll read this in the message. Many of you may have this memorized in other translations, but I love the way it reads. It's, it says, how wonderful and how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. The King James says, how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It is like costly anointing, and here's the metaphor, this anointing oil flowing down the head and beard, flowing down Aaron's beard, it's talking about the high priest, flowing down the collar of his priestly robes. And it's like, here's another metaphor, dew on Mount Hermon flowing down the slopes of Zion. Yes, that's where God commands the blessing. So anointing and blessing flow when we're not butting heads with others when we're not in competition with others, when we're not in conflict with others. It, there has to be unity. God commands a blessing when we are unified. We come together where two or three agree is in His name it shall be done. We come in unity and there is an anointing that comes from that. There is a, there is a blessing that comes from that. When people 
are territorial or protective in their positions in life, it leads to more conflict. It leads to more competition. And that's not of God. That can actually become a demonic stronghold. So we, we are bewaring, we're, we're going to beware of that, and we, we're going we're to get under the headship of Christ and get in alignment. When Jesus started his ministry, he went into the, he went into the uh, synagogue and he read from Isaiah 61. He read this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to, 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 to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus had an assignment. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit to take authority in the, in the kingdom of darkness. He had this anointing on his life to help other people. And that's what anointing is all about. I grew up in the church, and I remember people saying, well, boy, Sister, Sister McGillicuddy, I'll just throw some name out there. Sister McGillica, she is so anointed when she sings. Or, boy, he's so anointed when he preaches. And that may be true, but that's such a shallow understanding of anointing. Anointing is not for the personal benefit of the individual that carries that anointing. You know, it's not about looking good. It's about doing good. You know, I'm just telling, I'm going to be a truth teller here today. So many times we, when we want to walk in an anointing, it's because we want to look good. Rather, Jesus went around doing good, healing those that were oppressed, casting out devils. And when Satan came to Jesus, and the temptation was to use that anointing on himself, to perform miracles for himself, to turn stones into bread, to bow to Satan, and then he would get all of the, the wealth of this world. And, and so when we talk about this anointing, this blessing, it only flows if we're not butting heads with others we're in community with others. We're, we're in fellowship with others under the headship of Christ because that anointing starts at the top and it flows down to the rest of us. You remember the, uh, the story, there was the centurion, he was a Roman soldier and he had a servant that was sick and possibly ready to die and he, the, the soldier comes to Jesus and he says, can you come and heal my servant? As a matter of fact, if you just speak the word, I know that my servant will be healed. And then he explained. The, the soldier said, I am a man under authority. And I tell this person, go here or go there. And it's done. I know that if you just speak the word, that your word has enough power and authority to heal my servant. And Jesus said this. He said, he marveled. He said, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. Here this Gentile is showing his faith his faith was not just in Jesus' ability to heal, but it had to do with authority. He was coming under Jesus' authority and respected that authority, the authority that's just in his word. So Jesus had all power in heaven and in earth. There was given authority to him. The Bible says that Jesus, when he spoke, he spoke as one with authority. So let's read this in James 4, 6, uh, verses 6 and 7 again. It says, but he gives us more grace... That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submission is a prerequisite to resistance. If you're going to resist Satan, there has to be some level of submission into your life where you have come up under the authority and the order that God has placed on the earth. So here's my second point is what I want to wrap up with today. And that is power and authority are available if you don't butt heads with God. We know that anointing and blessing flow if we're not butting heads with others. But I'm telling you, y'all, that true power and authority are available, supernatural power to all of us, if we're not butting heads with God. Resisting God. Coming against God's plan, God's will. I think, I'll, can I just say this? I'm just going to say it, that demons, demons take over when you're not submitted to God's authority. They're, they're, Satan is unleashed whenever, see, here's the thing. When Satan was out of order in heaven, he was kicked out to earth and caused disorder on the earth. That's what's going on in our world right now. There are so many problems, so many issues. There's anarchy in the streets. There, 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 there is a complete and total disregard 
for God in his word. And consequently, I think Satan is running rampant, but I, but I think he's on a short leash. I, I really believe he's on a short leash. But we're, we're witnessing every day some, some, some significant events that illustrate how Satan is, is running loose. Check this out in Acts 19, 13. It says there are some itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those that had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. Trying to cast out the, the spirits. These were seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva. They were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. The only way we can resist the evil that's in our world, the only way lives can be changed, hope found, Chains loose. You know what I'm saying? Is that Jesus must be Lord of our lives. We must be under the headship and the authority of Jesus. It's not just name dropping. He said there are many that are going to call. Say, they're going to come and say, I, I, I called on your name. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not just about saying his name. It's about being under his headship, under his authority. Maybe there's someone here today, you're spiritually naked. Maybe you're spiritually wounded. Maybe the devil's been beating you up. You have authority if you're under Christ to resist. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore are you? Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Let your feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Yeah, have the shield of faith wherewith you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God has given us armor, but it's all under the headship of Jesus Christ. I want you to see on the screen the, this thing called anarchy. It's Satan's ultimate end game. And it, and it starts with disorder. He was out of order. There was disorder that ensued, and then there's division, and then there's disruption, and then there's destruction. The thief hath come but to steal, kill, and destroy. Destroy lives, destroy homes, destroy families, destroy our nation, destroy the world. He's up to something. You see, we already read about Genesis 3.15. We already saw where this, the head of Satan is going to be crushed. The head of Satan is going to be obliterated. That's the hope of the gospel. You know, this really affects us in real time. It does. It, 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 even in a family setting. It's not just in the Bible and in a church setting, but, but in your family. When the enemy wants to wreak havoc, havoc, what's he do? He gets kids to be disrespectful to their parents. Scripture says that the children need to honor their parents and Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you, that you may live a long life. It's the only one of the ten, ten Commandments that comes with the promise of long life because it's all about order. It's all about headship. And, and there's, a, there's some scriptures I want to show on the screen about God's order of things as it relates to the home. Look at 1 Corinthians 11.3. Check this out. This is not popular, but in 1 Corinthians 11.3, uh, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Look at Ephesians. Submit one to another. So this is all of us here, out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do in the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he's Savior. So there's, there's order. Now, I know it. Now that's not like, man, we shouldn't be quoting that scripture. Women, like, I remember when I first became a husband Sonia was in first service so I said this in first service so she would agree with me in saying this again but I'll say it again uh, when I first got married I wanted to be the boss and she's the wife and I wanted to tell her how the cow eats the cabbage you know what I'm saying like 
And I was kind of chauvinistic. And, and when I received the gospel, the Lord changed my heart. So I understood that, that God's order of things doesn't give me permission to be a sexist or a misogynist or, or rude or an overlord. But she's submitted to me. But, you know, I'm submitted to her too. I'm submitted to you. We're all submitted to each other. So God's order of things is really beneficial and it's countercultural. We, we live in a world right now where the very fabric of our society is, is, is being ripped to shreds almost. The, the patriarchal, theocratic society that God wants to set up on earth where we're under God and, and where families are in order and there's not chaos. When people are coming up against authority figures in their life, it's an invitation to Satan saying, come on, welcome home. When people are, are being rude to the authorities, to police, when we're, people are being rude to government leaders, God sets up kings and takes kings down. We pray for those that are in authority. We may not always agree, but we, don't, we definitely don't want to dishonor. Even David, when he was being chased by Saul, could have killed Saul. But he said, I'm not going to touch God's anointed. There's something about this headship thing that we need to get. Because if we don't get headship, we won't get worship. We won't get stewardship. We won't get discipleship. We won't figure out leadership. We, know, we won't know what fellowship is all about. It's headship. Because when there's headship, when we're under the protective covering of Christ, there's an anointing like no other. There's a blessing that God commands. There's a power and an authority that we have. And we as a church, when we welcome people in, that their lives are healed. That they're not coming to confusion here. We're not, they're not coming to a church where people are at odds with one another or fighting and butting heads with God. No, we're under this authority of God. And it, you know, I remember in school, I'd stand by my desk every morning as a kid and have to do this. We'd all, and they got over the speakers. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic, and we are still a republic, for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. One nation, under God, indivisible. Indivisible means it can't be divided. So we've been declaring that. The problem is that over the years, there's been a, an erosion of not being under God anymore. And so because we're not under God like we should be, now we're becoming divisible. Our nation is divided. This weekend, thousands of pastors and leaders from around the nation right in front of the Lincoln Memorial are praying and singing and saying we want to be under God I have a couple pastor friends that were there this weekend we want to be people of prayer that humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and he exalts us in due time I believe a revival is coming to America and I believe there are people that are called by, my, by his name that, that are all humbling themselves and God's bringing salvation strength and power Amen. So won't you stand with me today? I want to pray over you. This has been a great and glorious day. How many believe that lives can be healed and hopes can be found? How many believe that Jesus changes everything? Yes. Yes. Father, we want to thank you for your word today. Lord, there's so much more. We haven't even scratched the surface. And I pray, God, that you would impart to us the truths that we need to learn so that we can walk out of here and live with an abundance and, and live with, with, a, with a, a, a spiritual anointing and an authority that we can walk out of here and we can resist Satan. And, and I pray, God, that you would just grace us with your presence. Holy Spirit, we depend on you. Give us the wisdom. Teach us. Teach us more scriptures. Teach us things about your word so that we can live this out in real time. And for that, we give you praise. Everybody say amen.